the battle for the next generation of music fans. Uh, thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Um, so, quite a militaristic metaphor there, but um, uh, which, when you're dealing with kids, is maybe not appropriate, but hopefully you understand. It's also to do with my passion for this subject. So, um, I've come to talk to you today about something that doesn't really get talked about at music conferences, music industry conferences. I've worked in the music industry for, uh, 50, I feel old now, 15, 17 years maybe, and I don't think I've ever heard this being covered, or if it does, it's very fringe. Um, and it's a relatively new area to me. I've only been working in it for a couple of years now, but I'm hugely passionate about it. And I kind of, mostly this talk is like a cool, it's, it's a rallying cry basically. It's to get everyone to understand how important music is for children and how important children's music should be for all of us, not just people making it. So uh, without further ado, I'll get on with it. Um, so I come from a company called Yoto. Could I just have a show of hands? Has anyone heard of Yoto before? Well, that's not bad for you. Anyone got one? Anyone own a Yoto? Oh, there you go, yeah, lady with a baby, that's good. There's been quite a lot of kid and baby chat here today, actually, it's quite interesting, and, and including the last panel, actually, with people talking about being f scared of, of what kids do online, and we're not, we're not Luddites at Yoto, but what we've created is an audio-first platform for kids, which is screen-free, which they control. So uh, you'll see the picture up there is our original player, and what I have around my neck here is a Yoto Mini, so this is our mini portable player but like a kind of modern take on a Walkman in many ways. Um, so we sell the hardware and then we sell content on cards. You put the card in and it starts playing music. Skip tracks, little icons appear. That musician there is actually a gentleman called Chris Ballou, who was the lead singer of Presence in the United States of America. I don't know if anyone remembers that band. Old enough to remember them. He's now a kids artist, a very successful kids artist. But um, yeah, so that's what we make. It's, I feel it's a wonderful product. I fell in love with it, and now I work there. Um, you know, we sit in the world with a purpose. Like I say, we're not Luddites. We're not trying to hold back the winds of time. But we do believe that actually screens and kids has got to a place which is quite dangerous. You've got a situation where kind of uh, the stats are quite, like, you know, it's hard to research children. There's lots of ethical dilemmas, but there are bits and pieces that are done. Um, Ofcom did some research at the start of this year and they found out that during the pandemic, screen time for the average uh, five to eight-year-old went up by an hour and 20 minutes a day, which is a lot. Um, you've got a situation where in the US, a seven-year-old um, consumes something like five to seven hours of screen time a day, which, in, which actually, if you add it up, is 141 days a year. So we've got lots of screens, lots of kids. So what we put out there is something that's audio first. But I'm actually kind of want to take it above a level there and talk about music. So I look after music at Yoto. Uh, we also sell a lot of spoken word as well, which you might see there's a little roll dial card there. Card there. Um, but I want to talk about, I want to go right back to the beginning, talk about music and kids, do my little um, kind of evangelist thing next to a Catholic church. Feels quite apt as a lapsed Catholic. Um, so first thing to say is hearing is our first sense, right? When you're in the womb, 18-ish weeks, hearing starts to develop. At 24 weeks, tests have shown that um, children start to respond to rhythm and melody. Uh, they turn towards the sound. They respond to their mother's voice. Um, lots of amazing things happen once you're born as well with sound and music, um, which you know just kind of blows my mind. I'm the dad of a two-year-old. I've seen this. I'm starting to see it more and more. Things like um, recognizing songs that you're played in the womb after you're born, which is you know kind of mind blowing that your memory kind of forms then and keeps on going. Something else which is fascinating and quite nerdy is that depending on where you're born will dictate how you hear music. So if you're born in a let's say you're born in the UK and you will hear diatonic music with our 12 note scale, that will sound right to you. But if I play you gamelan music, which is microtonal, it will sound wrong to you. But a child born in Bali, gamelan sounds right to them. Our music sounds wrong to them. So, so many things are happening from before we're born right the way through um, when we're little kids. And if I can make it go. What happens when we're really young is music plays a really, really vital role in, in our development. So I'm going to show you a chart with lots and lots of words on. Sorry. Um, but I'll go through it quite quickly. But I'm going to talk through what happens at the start, the first half of this chart. And then I'm going to kind of skip over the second half because I think maybe this is changing. And that's why I want to kind of get everyone on my mission with me. So 
You know, when we're very young, um, music is, is so important in teaching us things like rhythm, coordination, language, communication, empathy, um, you know, the amount of singing that gets done in nurseries, um, you know, from parents to children, children to children, is massive. It's just a huge part. You know, I hate my own voice. I did hate my own voice. I kind of like it now because I'm singing, you know, so many songs all the time to my daughter that I've kind of, you know, start to dig my own voice. But um, it's a big, big part of how children learn about the world around them. Um, and what starts to happen when they get kind of past nursery into school is there's a really, really um, interesting time where learning music becomes interesting and actually the craft of making music. I'm going to come on to that at the end. I'm conscious of my time that I've got. Um, and then as you get, you know, into your kind of into double digits, the concept of taste starts to form, like what I actually like and what I don't. And that's why music for this younger audience is really magical, because kids aren't het up with all the things we are about what's cool, what's not. They don't have kind of tribal identities when it comes to music. They are, by their very nature, incredibly open-minded. You know, we sell music in partnership with the label Mr. Bongo from Mali, from Ghana, from Brazil. Kids love it. We get amazing feedback. If you try and sell some of that music to older audiences, it just doesn't translate as well. People don't want to, want to open their ears to it. And traditionally, what would happen when many of us were kids is that as we get into our early teens, we start to kind of feel peer influence, and then we sort of develop a taste. And music is a huge part of our identity. Um, but I feel that music, uh, the role of music in pop culture is, is changing. And I feel that actually music, the music industry is quite complacent about that. Or some of us have been quite complacent about that. So this is a kind of very broad chart, but just to try and make a point, which is I feel that you know, we've moved from an, an age where Pop culture was redefined really by music. You know, music was the primary force of pop culture. Everything from Top of the Pops to Smash Hits to MTV, it did drive culture. It was the main thing that drove pop culture. And what's happening now is that we are, it is still part of pop culture. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist as its own cultural form, but it's becoming a soundtrack. So it's becoming part of other things, and it's seen as maybe less important. And the risk is now we have a terrifying stat released last year by, again, by um, Ofcom, so it's a UK stat. 16% of three to six-year-olds are on TikTok every day. Now, I don't really understand how that's possible, but apparently it is. Uh, lots of people getting very worried about it. But kids are spending more and more time on platforms that aren't defined by music, where music plays a part, but isn't what it's about. So, what's the risk? Well, the risk is that as this generation grows up, Music could become just wallpaper to them. It just becomes part of something they do, not the thing they're doing. It isn't how they define themselves. And maybe it's never going to be like it was. But I think the risk is if we're complacent and we don't provide good quality music and musical opportunities for kids, we could find ourselves snookered. So, you know, music without true value um, and a generation of, of basically passive music fans. So these kind of conversations may not be happening in 20 years' time because people will just frankly give less of a shit about music because it isn't how they've grown up. And I, I think that really is a, a possibility. I'm not trying to scare people. I'm, no one looks scared, but I'm a little bit scared, so I kind of want to share that reality. So what can we do? I'm going to end, end on four very broad points, and hopefully some of you will join my merry mission. Um, if anyone's interested to know more about Yoto at the end, by the way, come and see me. If anyone wants to make kids' music, believe me, it's very fun, incredibly rewarding, and totally different from having to worry about those annoying adults. So. Uh, the four things. This one is so important, and I feel like I never thought it was part of my responsibility before. Um, the evil Tories have just ruined music education. Well, actually, and Tony Blair's government didn't do much of a better job. We've got a situation now where over a quarter of primary schools don't teach instrument lessons. A third of schools have stopped singing entirely, including singing to learn maths, which is a huge way, singing to learn phonics, which is a huge way of teaching kids in a very, very powerful way. So basically, it's getting killed. The music industry needs to support music education. We need to get kids learning about music, playing music, in order to appreciate music. That doesn't mean we're trying to make them virtuosos. It just means that they can take part. You know, there's a study released last week. Some of you may have seen it. Lots of coverage in the paper. If you learn a musical instrument as a kid, your memory is much better in old age. They feel like your chances of getting dementia are radically reduced. It's an early, early stage study, but it's, it's very interesting. So there's also good benefits for it. Um, second one, which is what I'm all about, invest in quality children's music. So don't see children's music as something which is 
maybe just for kids, like make it good enough so the parents like it too. We've really pushed that at Yoto. Don't, don't play down to the kids. There are other players in the kids' music market that are more visually driven, the YouTube-based, uh, where I think the quality of their music just doesn't stand the test for me. It is annoying for me to hear as a parent. Don't make stuff like that. Don't treat kids like they don't care. They do. They, they, they can appreciate what's good and what's bad. They can hear sophisticated things. So if you're working with an artist or if you're an artist making music for adults, try and make something for kids. In the 60s and the 70s, it was very common. All the Motown artists did kids' albums. The Beatles did kids', kids albums. And then something kind of weird happened in the 80s where kids' music just became about TV and it kind of just left the world of recorded music. And in some ways, you know, major labels are investing heavily in kids' music. It's, it's not being forgotten about, but um, I think the creators maybe don't give it the time of day. So please do. Um, this one... I guess is directed more at labels and at people that are curating content, which is how can we translate music for from uh, artists that are targeting teenagers and adults and make it suitable for children? Because frankly, <laughs> a lot of the lyrics are not okay. Even quite mainstream pop, you can't play that to kids. It's, it's, it's getting worse. And I sound like Mary Whitehouse now, if anyone remembers who she is. And I kind of feel like I'm becoming Mary, Mary Whitehouse, just a, a, quite a lot more left wing, where it is quite upsetting um, what you hear, you know, some adults, like artists say, just the sex references, drug references, like how can they still make music for children that's just as good, that can connect them with them, that can use their star appeal? Um, is that possible? I think it is, and we're seeing a little bit more of it now. And finally, this is a bit of an abstract one to, to, to end on, because I'm not sure there's a quick fix to this, but how can we ensure that young people understand the value of music, that it isn't just something that is automatically there and it's free and it's in the background, that has a value, that there is a tangibility, that they should believe in it. How can we educate them? Maybe it's part of music education. Um, and how can we make sure that other platforms that use music really value it so they don't just see it as the soundtrack, they see it as an essential part. Um, so that is my hopefully positive rant over. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>